So let's have a real talk conversation, fam. Because something happened this week that just set up the conversation at hand in the most perfect and apropos way. I was traveling internationally. I was in an airport on my way back to the good old US of A, on my way back to California. And as I'm walking through the airport, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a nice person. I like to exemplify Jesus. So I, I smile and say hello to random people. Like, it's just the spirit of God in me, except... As I was walking through the airport, I saw a man, a well-dressed man, um, stick his hand out and put something in my hand. Well, I received it because what am I going to do? Throw it on the floor? I said, oh, thank you. And then with a uh, provocative accent and amazing skin, he says, oh, la, la, let me have something for you. I have something even better. So he pulls me into his shop, says, this cream, this cream is like a magical cream. It lightens, it brightens, it, it tightens. No, you don't have wrinkles, but it's preventative, preventative. It. Which, first of all, he's already buttering me up because I get some little crow's feet up in here. But this is what got me. He said, this is the non-invasive, non-chemical Botox. All right, family. He, he hooked me. Can I admit that he hooked me? Now, he pulls me into his shop. He opens up this bottle. And with his finger, he begins to put a cream underneath my eyes. Now, now just pause for a second because if you know me, you know, don't touch my face. That's just gross. Like, I don't know you, but because I didn't articulate my boundary, a boundary was crossed unintentionally. Whose fault is that, his or mine? That's mine because I didn't articulate a boundary. So here's this guy that I don't know, putting something I don't know on my face, and I don't know if this man has washed his hands after he's left the bathroom, okay? As he's talking to me, he's putting this lotion on under my eyes and he pulls out a fan to dry the lotion and all of a sudden I'm feeling like a tingling sensation and then an inability to move my eye. As he's talking to me, I'm getting a little concerned because I'm blinking, but then this eye isn't moving and it's like my eye is frozen. It is at this point that I'm concerned and I say, you know what, I don't think this is for me, thank you so much. I'm getting concerned because my eye just feels like it won't fully close and I find my sister who was traveling with me and I said, Zoe, is something wrong with my face? And she said, oh my God, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know, but it feels like, it feels like my eye is burning. And she said, try blinking. I said, I am, I can't, okay? All of a sudden, I realized that there was a whitening happening underneath my eyes on the screen behind me. Friends, friends, okay, let's pull that down because that's horrible, absolutely horrible. My eye was frozen and I documented it and took a photo so I can send to my friends, like, why am I so stupid? Here's the thing that I was reminded of when I walked out of that store. Boundaries are not for others, boundaries are for me. Now, I'm glad I had boundaries to walk out of the store, but I wish I would have had better boundaries to never even go there. Now, I, I, I love that as we have this conversation, I firmly believe that by the end of our time together, not just today, but over the course of the next eight weeks as we unpack this topic of boundaries, that we're gonna have some order come into our life that might feel a little chaotic. I believe that boundaries are good. Boundaries are helpful. Let's think about this in a traffic kind of understanding. If we did not have a stoplight with yellow for slow down and green for go and red for stop, that would cause chaos. If we didn't have stop signs, that would cause confusion. If we didn't have boundary lines while we are driving, that would be dangerous. If you're the note-taking type, the title of today's message is boundary lines. Boundary lines. Why is that? Boundaries aren't meant to limit us. Boundaries are meant to elevate us, to lift our line of sight to say, who am I and who do I want to be? Over the next couple of weeks, as we go through this series entitled Boundary Lines, this is, let me be very honest with you, this series is not about who to kick out of your life, okay? This series is not about who needs to be put in a box and disciplined because boundaries are not disciplinary action. Boundaries, boundaries, this powerful understanding of boundaries is is to teach us how to love people well. And boundaries isn't about what they're doing wrong. Boundaries is about what I can do to love people in the right ways. Boundaries isn't about them. Boundaries is about us. Amen? Great. In the course of the next eight weeks, my goal is to, to unpack this concept of how do we keep the wrong things out and the right things in? 
The wrong things out and the right things in. Well, as always, I want to root this in scripture. And I love that the text that we're looking at today is out of the first book of the Bible. Right from the very beginning, God is very clear, boundaries matter. For my word nerds and Bible scholars in the house, what is the first book of the Bible? Genesis. Okay, Chris Galvez, you know, that's right. Yes. Genesis, first book of the Bible. If you brought your Bible, I want you to open it up and turn with me to Genesis. You're going to go to Genesis chapter two, uh, but I'm going to give a little bit of context in Genesis chapter one. In Genesis chapter one, verse two, we are told in scripture that the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the earth. The Hebrew word for darkness that's used here is better translated chaos. There was a chaos and confusion before the Lord brought in order. So God is creating order out of chaos. Do you want to know how he do that? How he did that? How he do that? (laughs) You want to know how he did that? With boundaries. He created boundaries. What are the boundaries? God created day from night, light from dark. What is that? That's a boundary. And he said it was good. God created sea and God created land. What is that? It's a boundary. And he said that it was good. God created animal and God created man and gave man authority over animals. That's a boundary and that's good. God said it was good. Boundaries are good. So let's jump down. You're already in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 verse 16 says this. And the Lord commanded, the Lord God commanded the man, you are to eat, or excuse me, you are free to eat. Somebody say free. Free. You are free. You have agency. You have mobility. You have latitude. You are free to eat from any tree. Somebody say any. Any tree in the garden. See, God gave freedom to Adam and to Eve. But, here's a but, and it's a big one. Look at verse 17. But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What is that? That's a boundary. There's a boundary. There's the boundary. And let's see the consequence. Do not eat from that tree. Look at verse 17. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The tree was a beautiful creation, but it was off limits. The tree was a beautiful creation, but it was off limits. In the beginning of time, we see that not all beautiful things are good for us. Not all beautiful things are good for us. In order to protect their freedom, God created a boundary and the boundary was needed to protect them. Now, if you're familiar with the creation story and the account in Genesis, there's a serpent, a serpent that begins to tempt Eve and and quite honestly confuse Eve with this simple question. Did God really say that you weren't supposed to eat of that tree? Did he but, but for real, did he really, like, did he really, really, like, like, how much, like, really? And since the beginning of time, the cunning ways of our enemy are asking us the same question. Did God really say premarital sex was wrong? Did God really say overeating was wrong? Did God really say pornography was wrong? And because we're confused about boundaries, boundaries are being broken. And when boundaries are broken, there is chaos. I've read a couple books to prepare for this series. Uh, My two favorite were uh, Boundaries by Dr. Uh, Henry Cloud and John Townsend, as well as Good Boundaries and Goodbye by Lisa Turkhurst. And Lisa Turkhurst has this phenomenal quote. She says, where there is chaos, there are no boundaries. Straight up. If you are experiencing chaos in your life right now, It could be that you don't have boundaries in the right place. Boundaries don't just define who we are. They define what we accept. I'm going to say it twice because it was nice. You're not taking your notebooks out, but I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that again. Boundaries don't just define who we are. Boundaries define what we accept. And where there is broken boundaries, there must be consequences. There's consequences to broken boundaries. Where do we see this? Right here in Genesis chapter 2. So Adam and Eve, they violated the boundary. They ate from the tree that they were told, you cannot eat from. And as a consequence, their free access to God and intimate friendship with God was affected. Now, pause. God did not stop loving them, but their access to God had changed. In fact, it wasn't just God. 
when Adam and Eve, Bible scholars and word nerds in the house, when Adam and Eve partook in sin, what was the first thing that they did? They hid. That's right. That's right, Mama Shavilla. They hid. They hid from God. So their access, their, their, their vibe, their connection with God was altered. Now, let me pause for a second because people are entitled to love, but they're not entitled to access. People are entitled to love. We should love everyone, but we also have to be mindful of giving limited access to certain people. So let's go over this and what happened in Genesis 2. Let's make it simple, make it plain. That's how I like to roll, okay? There was a boundary. God gave him a boundary. There was a broken boundary, which means there had to be a consequence. And consequence affected access. Boundary, consequence, access. About seven years ago, uh, I started this journey with creating boundaries in my life. In fact, I wish I could say that this series was formed because I know everything in boundaries. I wish I could tell you my boundaries are so high and so good and like, let me give you the insights of my wise mind. No, no, no. This series, ashamedly, I have to admit, this series is birthed out of not knowing how to do boundaries right at all, at all. At a very young age, boundary lines in my life were crossed and I didn't know this at the time. I was too young to know what boundaries were and I was too unaware and vulnerable to know how to protect myself. So uh, from the end tender age of five, uh, I believe, a belief was seated in me that my no didn't matter, okay? Uh, I accepted treatment from others um, because I was in a place of vulnerability. I, I accepted untolerable treatment and there was a seed that was planted in my mind a seed that was planted in my mind that germinated to voices that I would hear later on growing up as a teenager and as adult, that I am usable and I can't do anything to stop it. Because of what happened, that trauma that happened as a child, it affected me into adulthood. Why am I so passionate about us getting a handle on boundaries? Because I think about who would I, who would I have been had someone told me my no mattered? Who would I have been had I set better boundaries around my heart, my mind, my time, my energy, and my emotions. What I didn't realize until adulthood, through a whole lot of godly conversations, through therapy, through a good amount of theology and understanding a good God and why pain and trauma come in, is that I would allow these boundaries to con continually be crossed as a way to prove myself to others that I'd love them. That I allowed them to treat me poorly to be like, and what? I'm still here. See, you're not going to get rid of me. I allowed people to use me because in my mind, I'm thinking that's Christ-like. I'm called to forgive. I'm called to love. I'm called to deny myself. I'm called to give my life away. I'm, what I'm doing is being like Jesus. But over the past decade, I've realized that I've allowed. I'm going to say that again. I allowed. I allowed this treatment. I'm not a victim. I allowed myself to be treated in these ways, to be taken advantage and or of walked on, but through age, maturity, counseling, godly conversations, I now understand the why I allowed that to happen. I'm able to articulate why I allowed people to walk over me is because I was afraid that if I drew a boundary, that they would leave. And what I realized from that age of five years old is I didn't want to be alone because when I was alone, bad things happened. So I accepted bad behavior and unconscionable treatment because I was terrified of being alone. Abandonment issues are a real thing. So whether it was trauma that skewed boundaries or whether it was me trying to be Christ-like or me being afraid of abandonment, what I want us to know is that boundaries are not just a good thing. They're a God thing. And boundaries aren't meant to limit us. It's called to elevate us. We can, we can start looking at our lives differently. So let's talk about some personal boundaries. Uh, let's define a personal boundary. On the screen is the definition, and I'm going to read it slowly because it is important. According to psychological research, uh, personal boundary is a psychological demarcation. What's that? It's a line, okay? It's a line that protects the integrity of an individual that helps a person set realistic limits on participation in relationship or activity. The phrase I want us to hold on to is protecting the integrity of an individual. Why? Because all boundaries do is define who you are and what you're comfortable with. 
They define who you are and what you're willing to accept. Now, what's the problem and why can't we get our boundaries down? Well, maybe, maybe you don't even know what your boundaries are. So a big problem in talking to people about this boundary conversation is, I don't even know what my boundaries are. For me, because my mind and, and mindset and understanding was skewed at a young age, I didn't know that I could have boundaries. I didn't even know what they were. So maybe that's where our, we're starting today. Maybe it's identifying what is the boundaries I need to bring into my life. Maybe you do know your boundaries, but you haven't articulated your boundaries to your loved ones. Then that's on you. So it's not just identifying our boundaries. It's also articulating to other people, no, these are my boundaries. Maybe you find yourself like me, where you just can't say no. I'm a yes person. I love to please people. My heart is to serve. So I want to say yes to everything. I didn't even know I could say no. I, I had no no in me. My no was broken at a very young age, so I just thought, my no doesn't count. Or maybe, maybe you find yourself with good boundaries in some areas, but realizing in the course of this series, I have bad boundaries in other areas. So wherever you are on that spectrum, I want to talk about those tensions and then release them from us because I want us to have a good foundation as we talk about building great boundaries. Now, according to psychological research, there are five types of boundaries, five types of boundaries. And we're going to discuss all these in our series. So I hope you come back every single week because this stuff is really good. And I love bringing in some theology. I love bringing in some psychology. I love bringing stats and data. I love it. I love it. But you know what? Everyone's been sleeping on the Bible because the Bible has set boundaries from Genesis 1. All right. So it's high time psychology given the same level of Jesus. Here we go. I, I love that it's addressed in the word of God. It's not just biblical. It's also practical. So what I want to do quickly is I want to go over these five types of boundaries to get an understanding of maybe where we need to build some better boundaries. The first one, if you're taking note, is physical, physical boundaries. The question. Do you feel a certain way when your mother-in-law comes over unannounced to your house? Ooh, some of you laugh, but be careful who you're sitting to, mm -hmm, they're next to, yes. Do you feel uncomfortable? Does it make you feel a certain way? Are you irked when your friends feel like they have total control over your calendar and you have to accommodate them? Do you, does your family expect you at every family function, every birthday, every funeral, every holiday, every sweet 16 or quinceanera, whatever color you are, there are family expectations that you have. Well, maybe you might be struggling with the boundary of a physical boundary, a time boundary, or maybe even a close touch boundary. We're going to talk about physical boundaries in this series, but the beautiful thing that I love we're not alone in this. Jesus also had issues with these boundaries. In fact, his family, his family, we're going to read in a second, his family felt entitled to him, like they had ownership and rights over him. And Jesus set a boundary. The story that we're about to read, uh, Jesus' mother and his brothers, they're looking for Jesus. They want to have an audience with Jesus. They want to talk to Jesus. You know what this is? Familial pressure. Jesus had a boundary, and he was not going to be pressured by his family to stop doing his ministry. Mm, hold on, we're going to let that one sink for a second. Sink inside our hearts. What's happening is that we have friends, we have family, we have loved ones that are saying, oh, no, no, you have to, you have to do what we want you to do. No, no, you have to go to law school. You went to law school, you have to be a lawyer. No, 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 we're first-generation Americans. You got to go to med school. You got to make something of yourself. No, you can't be a, a teacher in an urban environment. We need you to go open a business. And there's all these familial pressure, spousal pressure on your life and your calling. And Jesus put a boundary on his life for ministry. Hey, don't let anyone else put a boundary on your life for what God is calling you to do. Look at, look at Matthew chapter 12. You can turn there or it's on the screen. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says this in verse 48. He replied to them after there's a knock at the door. Yo, Jesus, yo, Jesus, your mom is at the door. Like, what do you want us to do? It's, it's crowded. The whole city is there to hear Jesus. Jesus looks at his disciple and he says, who's my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus is setting a, a boundary against the entitlement of loved ones that are trying to pull him away from what he's called to do. So how much time are we giving people? How much authority are we giving people over our lives, over our calendar, over our time, over our physical presence? We might need to do a boundary around that. Do you find yourself over committing? Do you find yourself overworking or over compromising? Hey, you might need a boundary in that area. And this isn't just to protect your calendar. 
This is to protect your heart. Uh, Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your, help, guard your heart, for out of it is the wellspring of life. Now, for me, what does it look like for me? I, I'm, setting, I'm setting physical boundaries. Like, for work, uh, though it might not be my presence, a lot of my work is digital. So I don't want to get a text message about work. I, th- my, my, my cell phone is personal. Anything that's dealing with my work or with the church, I don't want it on my cell phone. We have a content management tool uh, for my NGO. I use a a communication uh, app called Basecamp. That's where I communicate with everyone. And if for church, we have a, the same tool called Basecamp. If it's anything for work or if it's anything for church, it goes on Basecamp. Don't text me. What I've done there is I've set a physical boundary. Another physical boundary is I turn my phone off at eight o'clock. I don't wanna have conversations, whether personal or private or professional at that time, because I need to protect my mind. I need to protect my heart. I need to protect my soul. I'm setting boundaries. Guard your heart for out of it are the wellspring of life. First boundary we see is, is, is physical. The second boundary that we can see is sexual. Now, we need sexual boundaries. And this is not just for the single folk where we tell people, oh, you know, just wait until you're married. No, no, no. I'm talking about whether you are married, whether you are single, there has to be boundaries, sexual boundaries. Why? Because it will protect you from either temptation or being triggered. Trauma and temptation are two very real things when it comes to uh, sexual boundaries. And we're definitely going to have an entire session about this. In fact, let me give you a heads up. In three weeks, we're going to have a conversation about sexual boundaries. And again, it's not just for the single folk. It's for the married folk as well. This matters. I'm seeing people walk around with such guilt and shame because there are no sexual boundaries and no one has taught them how to heal from sexual trauma. Now, we're not going to uncover that just in one session, but I do believe that the Spirit of God can show us how we can build better boundaries. This matters because I was preparing for this message. I realized that there are so many people within the confines and the walls of church that walk around in shame, oppressed, embarrassed, and silent because there's no sexual boundaries in their life. There's temptation. There's shame. There's problems in the marriage because we haven't articulated maybe a physical boundary that has found itself in the bedroom and is now a sexual lack of boundaries. Why does this matter? Well, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says, do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? This matters. We have to have boundaries. For me, a sexual boundary is I won't have a meal with a man that's not my husband. No shade, no shade. That is my boundary, that it defines me and what I'm okay with, but I don't even want to give the hint of anyone creating a narrative that I'm cheating on my husband. And also the enemy's cunning, because I could sit across a brother that, you know, maybe he's busted, snaggle tooth, the tooth coming off his neck, cock eye, unibrow, but then the enemy's like, oh, but he's so hot. The enemy is cunning, because people look cute when they're not even cute. You know what I'm saying? So I'm setting a sexual boundary. I will not. That's, that's a boundary for me. What about emotional? Emotional, so there's physical, there's sexual. What about emotional? In the name of love, we help people. Uh, We might allow boundaries to be broken when we're actually trying to help someone. But there's a phenomenal book uh, that deals with this, and it's entitled When Helping Hurts. Because sometimes, without even realizing it, we're enabling people to trample on boundaries for us and our health to heal them. It doesn't work like that. In fact, Jesus didn't heal the the people that needed him in every single way the same. He met them in different needs. And just because you're able to help and work with somebody in one way doesn't mean that everyone is entitled to that. Everyone is entitled to love. Not everyone is entitled to access. Jesus is putting a boundary around enablement, and let me prove it to you. In John chapter 5, we see that there's an invalid man, a man who couldn't walk uh, for 38 years. A man had been laying there, and during that time, in ancient times, there was a pool, and it was believed to have medicinal qualities. As in, if you were sick, you had an issue, you had an ailment, you could step into this water, and it was believed that you could be healed. Well, we're about to see right now that this man's response to Jesus sounds a little bit like self-wallowing, sounds a little like he's helpless, and Jesus is going to push on this boundary to be like, "Um, you're going to have to be responsible to believe for your own health and healing. Look at John 5, starting in verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there, he learned that he he had been in this condition for a long time. He asked him, do you want to get well? 
If you are constantly doing uh, ministry work with the same person and you're praying with them and you're fasting with them and you're interceding with them and they're calling you every day and it's been weeks and it's been months and it's been years and they're just an emotional drain on you, it, I'm not saying to stop loving them. It might be a time to limit access to them because if they're expecting you to heal them, they've gone to the wrong person. They've gone to the wrong person. Jesus asked the man, do you want to be made well? The ownership and the onus is on the man to believe. Jesus is setting a boundary here. In verse 7, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get in the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. It was up to the paralyzed man to be motivated, to believe, to step up and take those steps. Who do you need to set some emotional boundaries with so that you don't look like or be responsible for their growth, for their maturation, and for their healing? You might need a boundary. We don't stop loving these people. We might have to limit our access. For me, my counselor was talking about, we were talking about something in, not specific to this, but I realized, oh, he's encouraging me to set an emotional boundary. And he used the reference point of social media. Now, he hates social media. He's not on social media. He thinks it's the rise of the 21st century. Yeah, 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 I got it. I love it because I get connected with like friends and family and, and even people from church. But he said, I'm going to push you to do a detox of social media. And he said, yes, everyone knows that people are spending hours on social media. But my argumentation is beyond the length of time that people are wasting on social media. What we're now seeing happen is that people are looking at social media, spending time on social media, wasting their life on social media, and it's evolved. It's moved from you comparing yourself to someone and being envious. Now it's moved from comparing yourself, being envious, and then acting upon it. So you see that person got divorced and now they're skinnier, their life is better, they got straight teeth, I'm going to get divorced and I expect the same outcome. You see someone quit their job, go be an influencer and then you think, well, wait, I'm going to quit my job and be an influencer. And so what he's saying is I need you to unfollow everyone that is not on staff or your family. Just do a detox. What is he, do? What is he encouraging me to do? Create an emotional boundary. Create an emotional boundary. So we have physical we have sexual, we have emotional. Number four is spiritual. We need to create spiritual boundaries over our life. So Jesus set boundaries over his own spiritual needs, no matter what was ahead of him. It didn't matter the aches and the needs of the people that were just like begging to be around him. He set some emotional boundaries. In fact, in Mark chapter one, we see that Jesus, he heals a man who is demon possessed. In fact, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. She's about to kick the bucket. She's about to die. Jesus touches her and then she makes him like shawarma tacos and she's out there cooking for him. Well, no, word gets around town and people are like, yo, Peter, let me in. I've got a sickness. I've got an ailment. I've got this issue. I, I, where's this man named Jesus? They weren't seeking Jesus as savior. They were looking for Jesus as miracle worker. And let's pause for a second because there's a frenzy that shows up at Peter's house. They're like, Peter, Peter, Jesus, I want to see Jesus. He's the only one I could talk to. I only want to talk to Jesus. Let's pick this up in Mark, verse 35, 1, 35. Very early in the morning. I love that Mark puts the detail. He didn't say early. He's so drama. He says, very early in the morning. But there's more shade. While it was still dark. Okay. All right, Mark. We get it. Jesus is holy. He's rolling up at 4 a.m. before the sun is out. I mean, God the Father ain't up at that time. But there's Jesus. He is up. He is seeking the Lord. And he's praying. And I just got to pause because I'm a little convicted. If Jesus, Jesus woke up early to spend time communicating with the Father, how much more should I? How much more should I? I woke up at 4 a.m. this morning and I pray over you. I pray over the word. Uh, Bishop T.D. Jake says, preach yourself full and pray yourself empty. I was praying for you. I was praying over this message because I want to follow the ways of Jesus. You know what Jesus did before he poured out to anyone? He spent time being filled up by the Lord. He spent time. That's, he's, he's protecting his spiritual boundaries. Look at verse 35, we're still there. Jesus got up, so it's early in the morning. While it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place. He wasn't distracted. He got up early. He went to a solitary place, not to check social media, 
not to check his calendar, not to send emails. He got up early, not to go to the gym, get abs, gains. No, he got up early so he could pray. Simon and his companions went to look for him. When they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Don't get it twisted. People will do the same thing to you. Your coworkers at work, they're going to be like, you are the only one that knows the answer to this project. Your family members are going to say, you are the only one that knows how to talk to your cousin. You are the only one. Your children will be like, you're the only one to tuck me into bed. Your spouse is like, you're the only one that I trust with it. Listen, that's a, that's a lot, all right? That's a, that's a lot. Jesus wasn't manipulated by the needs of those around him. He went off to be alone. And when Peter rolls up, he's like, yo, dude, everyone's looking for you. You know what Jesus did? He said, let's go to the next city. Savage. Why would he do that? Because Jesus is on mission and he wasn't going to be manipulated or stop or meet every need here because there were bigger things for him to do. He was on mission. I don't want you to be manipulated and pulled off from family, from work expectations, from self expectations and pull you away from the ministry that God has called you to. And lastly, financial, financial boundaries. What does this look like? Well, of course, financial boundaries, Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. What does that mean? Pay your taxes. Don't be chintzy. Don't be shinsy, chintzy. Don't, don't be shicey. I mean, do what is right. But then also financial boundaries, which my generation doesn't like to talk about, living beyond your means. Rachel Cruz has this phrase. I love her. She said, act your wage. Act your wage. <laughs> For real, that's, that's a word right there. But we hate financial boundaries. We don't want someone to tell us how to live and how to spend our money, but you wanna know something? Boundaries aren't to limit us, boundaries are to elevate us. All right, family? No, uh-uh. There's also boundaries on like giving family money or a friend money, loaning money. Hey, what's the limit to that amount? Is there a deadline that they have to pay it back? If you lend a family member money, your sp is your spouse aware of it? Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. Boundaries are about keeping the right things in and the wrong things out. So we know that boundaries are biblical. I mean, from the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter two, but they're not just biblical, they're also practical. So boundaries as believers, I get it. This is a tough topic and that's why we're starting right here. Boundaries as believers, it can be confusing. It can be confusing. Maybe you haven't had good role models for boundaries. Maybe you weren't raised with a good reference point. It's okay, we're gonna start here. Maybe, maybe your filter is broken for accepting who you should be doing life with. Your filter is broken, who to keep in and, and who to keep out. That's okay. We're going to start here. Maybe you're confused as a Christian because you're like, the Bible says to love and to forgive and I'm supposed to be Christ-like. I, I get it. Let's start here. I, I'm asking you to do an evaluation. Out of the five areas that we're seeing are need for boundaries, where is one that's maybe weak for you? Maybe you've entered into a new relationship and you're like, I wanna love this person, but I don't wanna lose myself at the same time. Where do we begin? Maybe you've started a new business and your time and your energy, your resources all being pumped into this business. And it's a beautiful thing. Maybe God even asked you to start that business, but, but now you find yourself not keeping to relational commitments or friendships or, or church. That's okay. We're gonna build some boundaries. For me, for me, I need to work. I have great boundaries in certain areas and I have bad boundaries in other areas. I realized recently, I, I, love, I love work. I love you. Like, like low key, no, high key. I love you. I'm obsessed with this church. I'm obsessed with what God is doing. I'm obsessed with the call that God's placed on my life, but I'm realizing, oh, see, what's been driving me Probably for the last two years, it's been changed somewhere around November, December, of like this awakening and realization. But, but I realized that I was so terrified of seeming like I don't care. That if I were to set boundaries, that people would think that, I'm, that I am uninterested. But the problem is I care. I care so much. I want to hear every complaint, every solution, every quandary, every prayer request, every healing report. I want to hear it all. But I'm realizing that there's a huge danger in that that I can be so consumed with the church that if I'm not careful and if I don't build boundaries, that this community will be my identity or worse, it will be my God. I don't want that pressure because if this church never exists, it will not frame my identity. My identity is a chosen child of God with a call and a commission over my life that's not dependent on anyone else. 
except how God sees me. So if you're sitting here thinking, but I don't even know where to begin. I've done the self-help books and I've gone to therapy and I still feel like I'm struggling. Maybe, maybe I need to walk through this traumatic situation and see what God's trying to reveal in my life or maybe I've just built some bad habits. I don't know what you need, but here's the beautiful thing. The difference between the self-help book or a, theology, a psychology class is the fact that there's a spirit of God that can reveal things to us that therapy could never reveal. In fact, Jesus says, I want you to be as wise as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. So if God created boundaries in the Old Testament for our good, and Jesus lived out boundaries in his life for his good, the question I'm asking us today is, what boundaries need to take place in our life for our good? Do you need a physical boundary? Do you need a sexual boundary? Do you need an emotional boundary? Do you need a financial boundary? What boundaries do you need? because this is gonna require us to do work. If you want to be different at the end of this, this is gonna require us to do work. And work is hard, but I believe if you put in the effort, it will make a difference in your life. Spirit of God will illuminate areas in your life that you didn't know were broken, fractured, marred, or darkened. So here in this moment, I'm asking you, are you struggling in an area of boundary? I already told you, I already told you, mine is work. I love you. I believe that God has called me to this for this season. And because of that, I want to honor him. But I need to pull back and draw some really healthy boundaries. What about you? Do you have boundaries? Do you feel areas in your life where you're like, God, only you can show me how to change. If that's you, will you do me a favor? Can be honest in the house of God? Will you raise your hand and say, I'm struggling. I need to build some better boundaries in my life. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you to keep your hands up. If you're here in the video experience, I'm asking you to keep your hands up right now because this isn't an admission to me. Us raising our hands is a sign of surrender. God, the boundaries that I have let people take advantage of or have willingly crushed and erased, I can't do it. But I need you to step in because I know that you can. Spirit of the living God, for every person who is admitted, we can't do this without you. That the work ahead of us is feels so heavy and toilsome and hard. God, it's not too late to establish boundaries. It's not too late to create new patterns. So Spirit living God, will you give us your insight, your revelation and your strength? Do in a moment what no one else can do in years. We trust you with our pain. We trust you with our trauma. We trust you with our ache. We trust you with our disappointment. And we say, will you heal us and give us insight on how to build better boundaries? With every head bowed and every eye closed, will you do me a favor for, you can go ahead and put your hands down, but I do believe that here in the room there are people that have never said yes to Jesus. Oh, you've built a boundary, but you've built a boundary against the one who loves you, who could forgive you, who could heal you. If you've built a boundary against a relationship with God, hey, today's the day that a man named Jesus took your sin and your pain and your shame. And he went to a cross called Calvary. And on that cross, the boundaries that have separated God from man, sin from holiness, that day, that boundary was removed because a man named Jesus was crucified for our mistakes and our failures, what the Bible refers to as sin. And on that cross, he cried out to tell us die, which means it is finished. No longer do we need a mediator that we have direct access to a good God. If that is you in here today, the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus is inviting you into a right relationship with him. I'm gonna to count to three and when I count to three, if that's you, you wanna step into a relationship with Jesus, you can go ahead and raise your hand. But one, by raising your hand, you are saying, I want Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Two, by raising your hand, you are saying that my mistakes and my failure, the Bible refers to as sin could be forgiven. And three, the same power that resurrected Jesus from the grave will live in me. If that's you, one, two, three. Will you raise your hand and say, I want Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. Yes. Anyone? God bless you. God bless you. Anyone in the video experience? Yes. For those that raise their hand, we're going to pray a prayer of faith to let them know that they are not alone in this decision. Church, will you repeat this prayer after me? Can we say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind, and cleanse my conscience. Today I choose you as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit to do what I cannot do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.